at AIA Australia. We're making healthy living easier by incentivising your clients with rewards. Like discounts on their gym memberships, eligible flights and insurance premiums with AIA Vitality. It's no wonder that we've reduced client lapse rates by 50% and helped grow client engagement. To find out more, contact your AIA CDM today. Uh, come through we'll just uh spend a bit of time but today super excited we got Corey at Wasley um Papa Corey as I like to call him now with an 11 week old Baba uh and Paddy is also joining us so thanks for coming guys thanks for having us mate yeah if anyone hasn't seen um little Brady um he's he's been uh, quite prominent on social media in the last last few months <laughs> the kid's got his own hashtag. <laughs> hashtag Brady. <laughs> uh, for those that are interested, he's 12 weeks and he's uh he's flying. Yeah. Love him. Got his own hashtag. Listen, he's he's, he's gonna start trending on Twitter soon. So mm-hmm. thank you everyone for coming. We'll kind of get stuck into it. Just a few housekeeping things. Make sure you keep an eye on that Facebook group, it's going off. We've got uh, over 450 members, I think. I didn't actually check, but I'm, I'm predicting we do. Uh, it's conversations happening all day, every day. Um, you know, things about uh, product-related stuff, but more about, you know, building a business. So it's a really great community we're building through the Facebook group. So make sure you join in on that. Uh, XY Mastermind. So we started up 19 different uh, mastermind groups where advisors can come together. Only advisors can come together. Um, and just talk about what they're struggling with, you know, what they're doing well, uh, and then just support each other. So in small groups, 19 groups around Australia, there's some questions about what's going on. Um, so we've set up leaders for each group, and they got sent an email last Friday um, saying, here's your list of, of your advisors, contact them, um, set up a time that works best. So uh, you should be hearing from your, the leaders uh, within the next few weeks if you haven't already heard from them uh, yeah, and you should kind of come together and meet together in small groups kind of over the next month, month and a half. So we're super excited about that. Uh, and just also want to say thanks to AIA for supporting XY, XY Live, so these webinars. So let's get stuck into it. So today we're talking about, you know, setting up referral relationships. Um, so Corey, over to you. What uh, is your process when setting up referral relationships? Yeah, sure. So the I'll take you through what we've done um, and what's worked well and what hasn't. I guess the as a process, it's a combination of I guess a science uh, and an art, and I'll try and dive into both if I can. Um, our business is just over two years old, and one of the first things that we did, and I say we, this is James O'Reilly, uh, my co-founder, and I. We are uh, we went into your. I don't think so, mate. <laughs> Um, it's subjective, but um, yeah. But uh, one of the first things we did, mate, was we went out and built out a lot of referral partnerships with a number of different professions. We did it for two reasons. Uh, one is that we need to just essentially deliver on our brand promise to our clients. So, you know, we're here to solve problems and help them do the things they want to do in life and achieve things. And we don't have expertise in every area to get them where they need to go. So we need to call in other professionals to assist in getting them where they need to go. So that's. Uh, part of the reason, the other part of the reason is to help us build our business by bringing in referrals, which I think is what people want to want to focus on. So um, we started with LinkedIn, given that's where, um, I guess, professionals exist these days and it's the best marketplace to get in contact with them. So we built a process with the assistance of, I guess, a, a consultant um, initially where we basically went out um, in a targeted way to reach out to particular professions. It might have been accounting initially and then mortgage broking and then estate planners to connect with professionals en masse in a scalable way, which we ended up outsourcing. Um, And the ultimate aim was to uh, build relationships as quickly online as we could to take them offline as quickly as we could. Um, And from there, start to sift through and work out who ultimately is compatible with our business and with our clients and where where do we see a relationship that we think is worth uh, worth investing in? So just the process, just going back to outsourcing that LinkedIn, someone, you got someone to log into your LinkedIn account and just uh, find, you know, mortgage broker in Melbourne, connect, connect, connect. Is that kind of the process? 
It kind of was. I mean, but before we outsourced it, we were doing it ourselves and, you know, it wasn't working that well initially. We had to make a lot of iterations to the messaging and small iterations to the process. So I guess to take you through exactly what we did, um, we, we, we used the search filters initially to search based on you know, occupation, i.e. accountant, uh, proximity to our office, you know, maybe within 10 kilometres, um, years of experience, the firm size, those kind of things. And that would bring up a number of search results. Um, and then from there, you would go through the profiles and work out who do I actually think I want to connect with here? Um, and we might have our own kind of house rules around, you know, if they don't have a profile picture, we don't connect those kind of things. And we started sending out um, introductory messages, which said something like, you know, hi, Phil, um, I've just had a look at your profile. Um, given that you're in accounting and I'm in financial advice, it's likely that we've got some synergies. Would love to connect, Corey. And you know, we, might, we might go back a week later and go through all of the people that have accepted and connected. Then we send a thank you message, which might be something like, thanks for connecting, uh, Phil. Uh, if, if you want to make some time to maybe explore how we might be able to help each other and our clients now in the future, um, I'd be more than welcome to make some time to have a quick chat over the phone. If you can, let me know. So it, would, it, wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be pushy, but it would be a gate opener for them. Um, and from there, if they respond, yeah, great, that sounds like a good idea. I've been looking for an advisor or, yeah, I'm open-minded, let's have a chat. We then, this is where we take it offline, right? We then take it from LinkedIn to booking in a phone call. And that might be a short 15, 20-minute phone call. Tell me a bit about your business, who you work with, what are your motivations for being in business, um, what relationships do you have in place with advisors, what value do you see in working with advisors, and we share the similar type of things from our end. And that's just a pre-vetting exercise to work out, well, should we go and make time to cross the city and sit down and have a coffee and have a meeting? And if, if you think you should, then you know, go have that coffee, go have that meeting with the directors or whatever that looks like and, and take it from there, I guess. What, what were the key um, take out from you? When, you? when you're on the phone and you, you know, you've got, you're writing down their, you know, their business, the people they work with, what are the kind of key points that you would go, okay, this, this is someone I'm definitely going to have a, uh, you know, a coffee with. Is, is it uh, the size of their business or was it just kind of the more, uh, you know, touchy-feely, just how we kind of, you know, uh, interacting over the phone? Yeah, more the touchy-feely stuff, mate. This is more of the, the art to, to building these relationships. So the process to basically bring some people in and then from there, you use your own sense of intuition and judgment to work out the term we used to use a lot when we went through this process, which was cultural compatibility. You know, working out from a values point of view, how compatible are you with each other um, and how resonant are they with the way that you work and the sort of business that, that you're building. So, yeah, on those calls, if we're there and we're talking about verse and, and, and how we work with people and our motivations for working with people, and there's a great deal of passion and enthusiasm there if they're not resonant with that because you can feel you can feel it coming back through the phone or not coming back if it's kind of falling on deaf ears and it feels a bit ho-hum then that's just a red flag that um that you're probably talking to the wrong person um in if i can the best way to think about this is it's just like i mean you're an accountant or a lawyer or a mortgage worker they're still a person and the laws of building relationships with people still exist so like your spouse or a friend, there has to be compatibility and values to things that you value and appreciate. And if they're not there, the relationship, A, shouldn't exist, but if it does, it just won't last, it won't be sustainable. At some point, uh, it'll break down. So if you can start with just compatibility from a values point of view, um, that's the best foundation you can have. And then from there, if you've got some of the types of clients, if there's value you can add to their business and vice versa, then you can start to build something out over time. Were, were there any were there any hard numbers that you said okay this uh, just just from a numbers point of view this is probably not going to work whether they you know whether they work with you know business owners with fifty million dollar turnover plus you go well they're probably not the people for us or or if they've only been in business for a you know less than a year you you go okay just just from our experience we understand that. They're probably not the great referrer, um, so you know you'd cut it short there. So even if you had a good relationship over the phone and, and things are sounding good, anything from the numbers that you say actually, nah, probably not worthwhile for us. 
There was, um, but this wasn't done in a hard and fast way. We didn't have house rules. Um, but, you know, there was, there was plenty of times where we were sitting down with, say, a mortgage broker that was just getting the business off the ground um, and they had very few clients, they were getting very few referrals. And you just kind of, you make this internal judgment around how much of an investment do I need to make in this relationship relative to the ROI that we're likely to get out of it? And that's just a judgment call. Um, and some of those calls we got wrong, some we got right, um, but that's just a case-by-case -case basis. But having said that, there, are, there were occasions and there are partnerships that we've got where I'm thinking of one particular mortgage broker, young guy, early mid-30s, um, started at a similar point to what we did, um, highly resonant with what we do, um, but uh, was just getting off the ground and was just dealing with his own network initially, which was just kind of 25 to 30 year old first home buyers from his local hockey club and that type of thing. And we've, we've kept that relationship for the last kind of 18 months with very few tangible outcomes, but knowing that long term, given we've got faith in his ability to build a great business, that that relationship will grow and evolve. So again, it's a case by case basis. Yeah, and I guess I guess it's a judgment call of going, how deep are we going to invest into this? Because you can always, you know, invest a little amount on, with a few people and then just kind of keep in contact over time. And I guess that's kind of what you, you guys have been doing with, with that type of example. Yeah, some of those ones, you just got a relationship there where you might have a coffee every three, four, five, six months, you just touch base and be frank with them. Be frank about how you see that relationship now, how you see it evolving. Honesty is always a great policy when it comes to any kind of relationship. So just let people know where your thinking's at. And if, if they're not comfortable with that, then you know, that's, um, you'd rather have that conversation sooner than later. Yeah, awesome. So just remember, everyone who's watching, make sure you use the chat function, ask questions, we'll, we'll ask along the way and, and towards the end. So if you've got any questions about uh, you know, how, to, how to build relationships with, with potential referrers, so make sure you're, you're asking questions. My next question is, you know, what are some of the biggest successes that you've had and what are some of the biggest failures in terms of you've invested heaps of time and it just has, hasn't done anything? What are the mistakes? Yeah, sure. Um, in terms of these successes, so um, there's been a number of them. I mean, we're, we're at a point now where being just over two years in, we've got some of these relationships that, you know, they're almost two years old. And for the ones where we had that highest level of compatibility, these relationships have evolved to be really strong. Um, now where there's a consistent flow uh, of clients and referrals, we're beginning to leverage each other's businesses in ways that are probably more scalable where we're getting access to their client base more en masse, which I'm happy to, happy to talk about. Um, and coming back to, I guess, that brand promise that we have for clients and helping them get where they want to go and not having all of the expertise to do that for them. When clients now come into the business, we've got this tremendous ecosystem that they immediately become part of where if they need any kind of advice from any other kind of professional for any other reason, we've just got great people that we can look them in the eye and say, look, if you need a refinance, we've found what we think is the best mortgage broker in Melbourne because we've spoken to 80 of them. You know, and if they need to see a buyer's agent, same thing, or if they need in the senior estate planner. So, you know, and that has become a, a really tremendous value add um, for our service proposition as well. So I think they're really the, the successes. In terms of the mistakes and the failures, there's been heaps we've learned. Uh, we've learned a lot. Um, I think initially we, um, we perhaps tried to build too many relationships at the same time. And we went out with this kind of scattergun approach and after about, I don't know, maybe two, three months, we had about 30 referral relationships. But ultimately of those 30, maybe maybe eight of them still exist now. We've we kind of cast the net really wide and then worked our way back. But ultimately that left us spending time with professionals and other business owners that we got no yield from all of that investment of time. Um, I think that we would have deployed the 80-20 rule sooner and just worked out where is our best bang for back and let's double down our best bang for back and let's double down and triple down on those on those businesses and on those professionals and let's be quicker at, at identifying what relationships probably don't have much longevity in them and let's let's cut them let's cut them sooner. And and so I'd I'd love to just kind of go down into the learnings of of the people. How, how do you identify 
for someone out there who's like, all right, I need to go find that 30, how do they identify the, you know, the 80% who they're probably not worthwhile spending the time with? So looking back, you know, hindsight's 2020, looking back, uh, what are some kind of the key points that you would take out of certain relationships that just hasn't, haven't worked? Yeah, sure. Um, there's a number of different moving parts to making these relationships work, particularly if you want referrals from, from the advice partner. So the things that I've found that you want to focus on and identify as potential red flags or work on them to improve them for the relationship to thrive, um, one is for starters, you just need that level of resonance there. Um, second is that they need to have a process. I've, so regularly when you're meeting other professionals, they go, look, I love what you're about. I value your financial advice. Um, I'd love to get clients to you, but they just don't know how to refer. They don't have a system. They don't have a process. They have reservations about their own ability to prefer, refer in a professional way that enhances their own client experience, that doesn't feel salesy. Um, and quite often you need to sit down with these people and you need to actually help them build this process and help them understand their own client experience and say, well, when can you bring up this conversation? In what way should you approach it? Um, when should you make the referral and how should you facilitate the referral? And you might even have to, and we have built the collateral for them to actually be able to do that and build a process over time because everyone out there is busy, everyone's time poor, people don't have enough time to serve their own clients, let alone trying to have conversations about you and make introductions for you. Um, so you've got to make it as easy as possible. So, you know, getting them to be really honest with you about what are their reservations and being able to refer, what what can I hold them back? Um, and I found quite often it's just the fact that people just aren't regular referrals. They, they want to do it, but they don't quite know how to do it. You need to hold their hand, uh, hold their hand through it. Mm. I think I think a really good uh, discussion around referrals, uh, which Jackson has um, brought up, just about payment incentives. How do you incentivize your referral partners? So, just to kind of uh, hit on the question, uh, it's um, you know, what do you guys find works best to incentivize these relationships? Are you referring back? Or are you providing them a, a payment commission incentive? Um, and if you are referring back, uh, what's your approach to keeping all the referral partners happy? Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of the the fees and the commissions and the kickbacks, I mean, there's a number of different ways to do it. So I can only talk about our own experience and what hasn't hasn't worked for us, and that might not be appropriate uh, for everyone. But we've sought to build these relationships without payments going back and forth. Um, I'm not, and James isn't personally against that concept. We have one accounting firm where. Every time they refer a client, 20% of the upfront fee we send back to them, but they donate that to a particular charity, um, more so than putting it on their, on their bottom line. But I think if there is that compatibility and they want to refer to you for the right reasons, and that's not because it makes business sense for them, that's because they value what you do and they value it and they want your clients to go through that experience and work with you. Um, if that exists, um, it doesn't need these payments and unless you have a relationship where it's it's really lopsided um like any relationship it's a it's, it's a two-way street you know it's an exchange of value you know you need to be clear on what your needs are they need to be clear on what their needs are and you both got to work to meet each other's needs and if for any reason they're not being met you need to be communicating about it and if they can't be met that's a cost perhaps in the relationship just like a normal relationship um so Again, we're not averse to, to these payments, but from our end, when we find the people that are compatible with us, it, it hasn't been necessary. And they get excited about referring to you because it does enhance their client relationship. Mm. So, th I mean, that's, a, that's another good point just about uh, referring back. Uh, how do you manage having multiple uh, referring partners? Um, so you've got three mortgage brokers who refer to you. How do yeah. you m make that relationship work? Yeah, this, this, was, this has been one of our challenges. Um, it's less of a challenge now as we've kind of filtered the numbers down and worked out what are the strongest relationships there. But particularly early, because um, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket too. You, you don't want to say to one mortgage broker, look, I'm just going to invest in the relationship with you and hope that, hope that we both reap the benefits of that. Because if that relationship doesn't evolve and doesn't bear fruit, then that comes at a significant opportunity cost. So, 
we uh, we had this challenge where when we had only just a few clients and we had just a few referrals to give out, where do you send those referrals? How do you satisfy all of those referral partners? It was a challenge. Um, and that was part of the reason why we couldn't sustain as many of these relationships as we started. Um, but the best way to manage it is really simple. And it's just being honest with people. It's being frank and saying, this is where we're at. We're working, we're working with three mortgage brokers. You're one of three. And we're at a point now where we're working with predominantly two mortgage brokers, but one we get a lot of referrals from, another one we get not so many from. And he and I had a coffee a few months ago and I hadn't referred to him, or we hadn't referred to him for let's say three or four months. And I just said, look, we've got this other firm. This is the firm, these are the professionals. He happened to know them. We're getting X amount of referrals from them. And despite the fact that I love the work that you do, and I'm comfortable referring to you, it doesn't make any business sense for us right now to refer to you for these reasons. Um, but having said that, I think that if we look at our relationship, let's work out what are the flaws in why it's not working to its capacity and let's start to work on those. And he appreciated just understanding where he stood. So, you know, if you're, if you're gonna kind of tiptoe around and be on eggshells, that's just not how you build good relationships with people or professionals. So you just gotta be honest with people as to where you're at and set good expectations because um, disappointment is a result of poorly set expectations. Yeah, so so now going forward, are you thinking the best way forward for Verse is just to have one in each category that you refer and get referrals from? Is that the plan? Yeah, it's not the plan. We don't have a specific plan here, uh, Tomo. We are, ideally we'd like at least a couple in every profession. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. We've got a really broad brush kind of client base. We've got younger clients, older clients, high complexity clients, lower complexity clients. So it made sense that we would have, you know, a few accountants, maybe one that deals with entrepreneurs and franchisees and startups and one that deals with more high net worth, maybe older type clients, maybe one that deals with those middle-aged business owners. So when we're referring, we can refer them to someone that's going to be a good fit for them. If you had a, a more of a concentrated client base and you just dealt with, say, you know, people that are Gen X or, or Gen Y, you could probably more easily take that approach. But for us, it just doesn't fit for our clients. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. I, I had a meeting with a, a potential referrer two days ago and I said to them just straight up and down, just said, look, I don't really deal with clients above 50, so... Uh, for you guys, I would get two financial planners in, one that works with pre-retirees, retirees, and that'd be a great fit for those type of clients. And then anyone under, you know, 50, 45, um, that might be a great fit for me. Um, and so, yeah, whether, if you do specialise, then yeah, maybe it's a it's a, only ever going to be a one-on-one, -on -one, um, but just obviously partnering with those referral partners who specialise in that same area, which is kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, well, well said. And so when you, when you think about, I think instinctively you think that for the relationship to survive, it has to have a two-way flow of referrals. It, it doesn't always. It has to have a two-way flow of value. And value doesn't always have to be referrals. So when you're going out and you're building these referral partnerships, um, you really want to take the time to get to know them, their business, how they do things, and start to think more laterally about how can I actually add value to them? Because maybe perhaps you don't have that many clients to refer to them based on where your business is at, but they've got a lot of clients to refer to you and you want to make that happen. So you start start thinking about how can I help them improve their business? Can I help them improve their client experience? Can I share some of the technology that we're using in our business to create efficiencies that they might not be familiar with? Can I get them in, you know, be a connector? You know, if they're an accountant and they need a great commercial lawyer and you've got one, make the introduction. Um, you know, if they're a family lawyer and they'd like to be able to refer their clients to a great mortgage broker, make the introduction and start adding value to their business in different ways. Um, and that quite often can be the way where if it is a bit of a lopsided relationship, you can still make it work, provided the things that you're doing, you know, the partner actually values. Yeah, and I think, you know, as, as you talked about and you've kind of mentioned over and over is just honesty. Like, as I said, my meeting two days ago, I just straight up said, look, 
I don't deal with volumes of clients, so my referral is going to be pretty low. Um, but And they said, look, that's fine. Because, this is actually a financial planning firm who just wanted to specialise in risk. And they said, that's okay, because we just really want a good financial planner who we can refer our clients to, who we know aren't going to steal our risk clients. Because, you know, as we kind of know, risk insurance commissions is just one sign form away from going to another planner. So the value that I added was just that trust factor. And that's really what they were looking for. Um, so yeah, just, just being upfront and communicating is, is a great takeaway. Uh, we'll go to, we'll kind of just get through these audience questions because we've got some ripper questions here. Uh, Dylan Martin is said, um, you know, the challenge for Dylan is, um, uh, wait, this is a challenge for us. Can you expand on if the phone calls are awkward or uncomfortable? So those initial phone calls that you're making, uh, or if both open-minded and happy to have a chat it out. Um, also, um, also if it's a no-go, how do you end the call? Sure. Um, are the calls awkward? Um, my experience is no. Having said that, if you're an awkward guy, they're probably going to be awkward. So it, it just depends. <laughs> but... Um, so but Phil should pick up the phone then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Phil should Phil should be off. Stick to email, Phil. <laughs> Stick with places where people can't see you or hear you. Um, well, well said, Patty. It's nice to see you getting involved too, Patty. I was wondering why you're here for a while. Oh, I just like letting Phil have the limelight for a while, and I know how much he enjoys it. So, <laughs> mate, I don't I don't let Patty talk. That's that's the truth behind the matter. With with. Uh, my advisor. The more I talk, the more the more chance there is of something going wrong. Yeah. So, <laughs> that, that's a great segue into the other questions that we have. Um, <laughs> I thought I thought it was really good to um, a few of the guys were keen to unpack the um, how you guide guide the advice sorry the accountants or the other referral partners in referring. So, what are some of the steps that you did to give them a hand or? sort of massage that and sort of what, what is there specific tips you can give people to, to go through with their referral partners? Yeah, sure. I can, I can share what we've done. I'll just, just if I can, Adrian, I'll just get back to Dylan's question, just make sure I answer it for him. In terms of those phone calls and, and making sure it's not awkward, um, go into the call with a process, um, go in with a specific game plan and know that when you make that call and they pick up the phone, Know exactly how you're going to set expectations around the call. You know, you know, you know. Hi, Dylan. You know, thanks for taking the call. Um, yeah, make sure. You know, I've allowed about 15 minutes. Does that suit you? Great. What I'd like to go through on this call and work out collectively are these things. Um, I want to learn these things about you and your business, and it's probably an opportunity for me to share these things about you. And if collectively we're both feeling good about things, maybe we can go and organise a coffee at the end of the call, um, and then. The tone set, the framework set, and then it's a matter of just kind of executing on that. So that's maybe a good way to approach those calls. Okay. Yeah, apologies, Dylan. I was, uh, I was distracting Corey from uh, that excellent answer. Um, so, uh, was, was that okay, Dylan? Did we cover off uh, what, were you, what you wanted to cover there? <laughs> Patty, that's why I don't let you talk, man. <laughs> it's, it's, all going, it's all going downhill now, isn't it? Yeah, it was going so smoothly yeah, until, I, until I opened my mouth. <laughs> Dylan thinks Phil should take back over. I, I think we should jump into the, the tips and tricks around um, training referral partners. So I reckon, I reckon you would have done some pretty cool stuff. You guys are pretty in, um, got some good heads on you, you and James. So what, what are some of the, is there documents that you can give them? Is there like, what are, what are the practical things that we could use to help? Yeah, sure. We, um, we initially started with a lot of different documents and paraphernalia and worked out that that was probably a, a bit overkill. You want to just keep things really simple. Um, just give people the key things they need to know. You know, 80-20 rule. There's probably so many things you could focus on and explain and take them through, but just focus on the things that are most, most pertinent. So I guess the things that I would recommend that you work on with people uh, is one, one, just making sure they've just got some principles that they can apply to the approach uh, of referring. Um, we've put together about five, six principles that we share um, with, uh, I'm just grabbing them so I can, I can read them out um, with referral partners. Just so they've got the, the right mindset that they take to 
you know, making those referrals and having those conversations about us. I've got number one, you make it a process. If it isn't a process, it probably just won't happen for you. Two is flag it early in your process. You know, the moment, the moment that referral partner identifies they probably should work with the financial advisor they'd like to refer them to, they don't have to refer in that moment. You know, if, if it's a mortgage broker, for example, and they're having their first meeting with a, a client, the client's priority is getting the finance for the home or for the investment, and that's what they want to get done. So the mortgage broker needs to acknowledge that and respect that. So maybe it's a matter of saying, hey, look, um, client X and client Y, y just based on what I've learned about you guys tonight and the things that you've shared and, and your plans, I really think you'd value getting financial advice for a couple of these reasons. Um, now, I know your priority is to get the finance done with me, so I want you to know that's also my priority, but I want you to know that at the right time, I'm going to come back to this conversation and talk in a bit more detail about why I think you might, you might get advice and then make an introduction to the right team for you. So that seed's just planted in the mind of the client. It's not getting in the way. The client says, okay, great, yep, thanks. We'll get to that at the right time. And then it's an easier segue into that conversation at the right time in that in that person's process. So um, number three is, is, is pretty long there, which is get your, get your stuff done first. Um, same when you're referring out, you know, if you need to refer to a mortgage broker or a refinance, the client came for financial advice, get the majority of the advice done first before you start convoluting their experience. Um, don't be a problem solver. You know, if you've got that account or mortgage broker or lawyer that's trying to have conversations, like I think you need income protection and it probably should be on a level premium and you probably should be funding it via super or I think you do need an SMSF. Don't have them go down that path. Have them talk philosophically about why they might need to get advice and the value of advice um, rather than trying to be specific about problem solving. Um, get them to encourage a conversation. You know, get, just have them help the client make a baby step. You know, and that might be, you know, not I'm going to book a meeting for you with them, that look, I think you'd really got value out of talking with them at the very least. I want to make an introduction to Phil for you. Um, I'll organise that over email, email be a three-way email. I'll leave your contact details there. Phil can get in touch with you and just have a ca casual conversation about where you're at, where you're headed. Um, you can ask questions of Phil around the people he works with and how, uh, how they give advice. And if you're feeling good about it, then they can take you through what the next steps would be from there. And just kind of make, make it easy for people, make it not feel overwhelming for them. Um, and the last one is, the referral partners is mean what you say. Um, you know, people people can smell authenticity and they can smell inauthenticity. Um, if that referral partner really doesn't value you, really doesn't value your advice, really doesn't believe in what you do, the person they're talking to is going to smell that. Um, conviction and confidence goes a long way, and the client almost always mirrors the professional in in terms of the air of confidence and conviction. So, you know, if you are trying to build this relationship with someone that really isn't that excited about their clients getting advice, then you're probably just working your way down a rabbit hole that isn't going to yield many outcomes. So, um, yeah, if, if they don't believe it and there's not an element of conviction or passion there, then, yeah, you know, you're probably wasting your time with them. Now, that's good tips, Corian. I know you're going to uh, put that uh, those points up on the Facebook group um, so so everyone can see it. Um, next question is from Shane Hayes. He said, so traditionally planners look at accountants, mortgage brokers. Have you guys looked at any kind of outside the box referral partners? Yeah, great question. Um, we're just, just starting to. Uh, James has spent a bit of time working or, or getting in touch with some business coaches uh, recently um, and executive coaches. Um, so the answer to that question is uh, no, we haven't, but we're just starting to. And I think that depending on the way you work with people, um, that could be a really good avenue for uh, a lot of advisors out there, particularly people that are operating this new world of advice that's personal and purposeful and outcomes focused. Um, you don't just need to deal with the accountant and the, and the broker and the lawyer. Yeah, Shane's actually got another question, just follow on, just with regards to um, KPIs and, and reviewing the referral relationships. What, uh, do you guys have set KPIs or is it just uh, do you set that with a referral partner at the beginning? No, we haven't. Um, you know, maybe we, we could have or, or we should have, and that might work really well for others. But 
We typically haven't. Um, you know, these we, we, we communicate regularly. The flow of referrals, you know, progress isn't linear. You know, it's up and it's down and it spikes and falls. Um, so I think just consistent communication around where you're at and, and how things are going and what isn't working has been our way of, I guess, making sure that uh, um, there's accountability. Yeah, the um, I guess there's a few, there's a bit of consistency in people talking about, I know you just touched on it there when you were answering Dylan's question or Shane's question around um, outside of the box, our referrers, like we've got, um, We've got a few um, talking about plumbers, builders. Um, what are have you? How broad have you guys reached in? Have you, have you explored tradies as um, as options um, in terms of just referring them out, or or the other way around as well? No, we haven't. So we focus on uh, accountants, mortgage brokers, uh, estate planners, family lawyers, buyers agents. Um, and to a lesser degree, commercial lawyers. They're kind of the, the six. Um, but I, I do get Shane's point, and I do think that's maybe part of our next step in building our network, is going out to not necessarily tradies. You've got to think about how do we work with clients and what is our proposition and making sure that the people that you're trying to build relationships with are going to be congruent with that in the way that they think and the way that they work. So. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're dealing with a tradie and you just want, you know, a risk referral, you can probably get that relationship to work because they can probably be out on site talking with other tradies about like you need income protection or you've got kids you need life insurance. If you just want to take that work and do that kind of niche work, that might work well for you. But from our end, because our engagement's quite holistic, um, we're looking for more philosophical alignment just than particular scope alignment, if, if that makes sense. So it's it's courses for courses. So I wouldn't rule out that approach, but um, it's not one that we think would fit for us. Well, if anyone out there in um, in the session today is is having success in that area, please share it. Um, like this, we'll take this to the Facebook group. Um, Corey looks like he'd be interested to hear how you're going, and if anyone else had tips around that broader scope of referring partners. Um, Patricia was was delving into uh, LinkedIn. She was specifically talking about um, checking if they already have financial planning. Um, so I might have broaden that and just go sort of what what filtration process did you have um, when you were scoping who's in, who's out of those um, those inquiries and who you approach? Yeah, sure. Um, a lot of the a lot of the filtering we what well, they essentially did. So we'd run through the searches, we'd make the connections, and I mentioned after a little while, once it was kind of working well. We outsourced, you know, going through the search filters and sending the connection request with the invitation message and the, the follow-up thank you message uh, to a wonderful lady called Oshin uh, in Jamaica. Um, and I guess when you when you send out that when you send out that invitation, um, you you should be creating your own filters for them. So you've got your own profile, right? And whenever you send out that invitation. The person that receives it, probably within about three seconds, they're going to make a quick judgment call as to does this person look credible? Do they look professional? Do they look like someone that I want to get to know? Someone that I want in my network? Someone I could get along with? They're quickly making these quick snap decisions. So um, you want your own profile to be a filter for them. You want people to filter themselves in because if you're going to go and connect with you know 300 people en masse, it's really hard to have great filters. Um, you want to make sure that you've got filters that they can use, and then from there, if they if they think that you could be good fit for them, then you can work that out between you collectively on the phone. Yeah, great. So, so Chris has asked a question. Uh, I'll I'll kind of uh, frame the question. Do you guys do formal referral agreements with your referral partners? No, no, we, we don't. Um, we've in recent times we've had some conversations about. Um, and more formal JV with, with different firms and what that might look like in the future. We haven't acted on any of that, but up until this point, there's been no formal referral uh, agreements in place. And, okay, because Chris was asking you to share some of your, your agreements, um, so I guess you'd say, no, get stuff, Chris, we don't have any. Well, uh, I'd say, Chris, if I had them, I'd be happy to share them, mate. But, um, 
But <laughs> we, yeah, we, we, we haven't got them. But again, that's not to say that they might not be really valuable for, for others and, and maybe something that we should have, we should have done or been doing. Mm, so taking it down that uh, referral to JV, um, what, what is your kind of, you and James, what are you thinking around that? Would you prefer to stay out of the JV kind of space so you can um, keep yourselves open to uh, all referral types or is it like, well, that's just the logical next step for us? Yes, yeah, good question. I don't have a clear cut answer for you. Um, we're we're, we're open-minded essentially. We're always open-minded to any opportunity. Um, we want to keep our, our ability to refer to professionals open because we think that is what our clients deserve. Unless we felt like we wouldn't opt into a, a JV with an accounting firm if we thought that account was only a good fit for 40% of our client base. That's that's not what we're about. So, you know, we've, we've, we've got that complication. So we're open-minded to hearing, you know, what people want to do or, or opportunities they want to explore. But um, first and foremost, we need to deliver to our clients and if that creates complications or roadblocks then you know that would that would be a stumbling block for us and so just to keep following on this jv is is sure. the discussions around setting up jvs more coming from your referral partners wanting to set up the jvs or are you guys thinking okay how do we look at maybe expanding into accounting in a really uh simple way Sure. Well, yeah and to, to this point it's more come from others um at the right point, we'll be more strategic and proactive um, around uh, those kind of opportunities. But first and foremost, we're just trying to get our own house in order. You know, we're only a couple of years in. We're trying to get our own client experience right. We're trying to get our business to a point where it's got more stability than it's got uh, right now. You've got to do the right thing at the right time. You know, call before you walk. Now we want to get all of our ducks lined up before we start thinking um, about those kind of things. Yeah, the um just just on the uh, the client piece with the different um, referral uh, broadening the scope. Dylan sort of specified um, within your client base. Has there been any um, this year? Do you refer your clients to each other? Is that something that you've done? Or sorry, can you ask that question again, Andrew? Um, so yeah, I, I'd sort of interpreted Dylan's question of not exactly what he was after. He, he wanted to know if in, in terms of your client base, cross referring within your client base, just, just your clients to each other where, where it makes sense for them to talk to each other. Is that something that you've been doing and, and is it? Sure. Uh, it's not something that we've, we've done, uh, a lot of, uh, we're not close minded to it, but yeah, no, it's not something that we've, we've, uh, we've done a lot of. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, there's, um, I guess we've got, how are we doing there, Phil? Are we? Mate, we're doing good. We, we're learning less important lessons, not to leave Patty in charge. Very important lessons. Corey, um, before we kind of finish up, because we are smack bang on time, uh, yeah. and just want to respect everyone's time, uh, what are you kind of your last um, bits of advice, whether setting it up and just the way you, uh, you think people should be thinking about referral relationships? Yeah, um, just try to keep it simple. Um, look for people that um, are compatible with you from a values point of view. Just look for resonance. You know, look for people that you get along with where you, know, you really respect and appreciate the work they do, their client experience and how they go about things and people that feel the same way about you. And if that exists, like any relationship, then you can start to build it out over time. You know, and the processes that you use and the systems that you put in place or whether you're putting in, you know, partnership agreements and the like, that all comes secondary to just making sure that there's some compatibility there. Um, and if that exists, then you can, you can work out yourself as to um, how do we strategically and systematically build this relationship to support you and us and collectively our clients. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. I think my three big takeaways from our conversation was uh, number one and most important thing is just to always be honest um, and make sure your referral partners are being honest. Uh, the second one was, yeah, look for like-minded uh, professionals, which is what you just touched on then. Um, and the third thing when thinking about referral relationships, my takeout was um, try not to think about it being a, a huge, big beast and scaling it, uh, but just really pick some uh, really good referral partners, you know, two or three in each profession. Would you agree with that, Corey? I'd agree with every bit of that, Phil. Well said. I'm glad you're here.
I'm just, I'm just reiterating exactly what you said, so I hope you agree with it. So okay. thank you, everyone, for coming. Make sure you do jump into the Facebook group if you're not already there, which I hope everyone who's on here is already in there uh, because it is going off questions every single day. Uh, so make sure you jump in. Um, and thank you very much, Corey, for kind of uh, coming and giving us all your insights in what you've learned over the last two years at Verse. More than welcome, guys. I, I appreciate you, ha- you, you guys having me on. Champion, Corey. Cheers, Thank you, mate. everyone, for coming Bye. and have an awesome week and we'll see you all next week. Bye. Ciao.